So let me talk about London's flora. And um, first of all, let me explain what I mean by London. We take our cue from the London Natural History Society, who formed in 1913 and decided that a good definition for botanizing from London would be 20 miles from St. Paul's Cathedral. So that's what we take. Basically, uh, it extends from Welland Garden City in the north to Reigate in the south, and from Egham in the west to Brentwood in the east. It's a, it's a bit more than 3,200 square kilometers. So a bit of background. The, the thing I think that we need to appreciate is that all of the plants in London are there for one reason or another because of people. So most of them are planted by people for shelter or ornament or food or whatever. A few of them are remnants of semi-natural vegetation and they're cherished by people as such. And the rest, the uninvited, if you like, haven't yet been eliminated by people, but they will be eliminated in short order by bulldozers or herbicides or whatever. So let me show you what mainstream urban botanizing in London is about. Each of the communities I show you will have multiple species in them and characteristic relative abundance of species. And I'll just show you one of the most characteristic species in each of the habitats because of the limitations of time. So urban botanists typically gravitate towards waste ground. It's the most species rich habitat in towns and full of interesting aliens like Erigeron sumatrensis here. The streets have their own very characteristic floras often characterized by self-seeded alien trees like this tree of heaven here. The railways, of course, as you all know, are dominated on the, uh, the non-herbicided bits by, by thickets of Budleia. I just ask you to consider how much money network rails spend on herbicides just for the control of Budleia dividii. Not to mention the effects, the negative effects of Budleia growing in all the brickwork of all the railway arches. Cemeteries have a very characteristic flora. One of the most um, typical species of the gravelly tops of graves is what used to be sedum rupestre, now petrosedum. London's waterways have been clogged over the years by a range of different aquatic aliens. The most recent problematical one is this one here, which can be spectacular as here, hydrocotyle ronculoides. Because they're not grazed, the motorways have a very distinctive flora of very tall plants, uh, the most obvious of which is hemlock, Conium maculatum, with its blotchy stems. So London over the years has had some very distinguished botanists, but one of the heroes of London botanizing is Brian Wurzel. One of his great achievements was to discover the extreme rarity, Apium repens, um, on the Essex bank of the River Lee in Walthamstow Marshes. This was only its second UK site. The, the other site is in the water meadows of the Thames at Oxford. Here is Brian demonstrating to me the extent to which cut-leafed teasel uh, can grow large on this wonderful piece of waste ground to the north of um, King's Cross Railway Station. This used to be a superb botanizing site, um, but nowadays it looks like this. So a small number of property developers are very happy about this, but biodiversity positive, I don't think this development has been. So Brian's name will live on forever. He, he discovered this extremely interesting hybrid between Artemisia vulgaris and Artemisia villotiorum in 1987. And if you're in the London area, this is the perfect time to go looking for the hybrid because it's in flower at its peak in November. And you know it because the um, anthers are shriveled. It's completely infertile. Otherwise, it's extremely difficult to tell from um, the fertile uh, Artemisia villotiorum. 
So here I want to concentrate on London's extraordinary variety of different forms of housing. Each of these has a really characteristic flora in terms of species richness and relative abundance, but I only have time to show you one species from each habitat, and I hope I've chosen interesting ones to show you. So we'll start with townhouses, very characteristic of central Western London. They look like this. And if you have 25 or 26 million pounds to spare, this can be yours. So basically what townhouses are, they're terraced housing for people who have servants. The basement window wells, where the lower orders have their social lives, creates a very distinctive habitat and in that habitat, one plant is really distinctive, and that's this one, Campanula poschaskiana. So it's a posh plant for posh people. The other extreme of terraced housing was where the lower orders lived, and the terraced housing in London differs very much by century. So this is what the 18th century ones looked like, the ones that have survived the blitz and slum clearance, they opened straight onto the street. So as you can see, there's very little room for plants, but there is a very distinctive species of this habitat. And it's this one, it's pelletry of the wall, Parietaria judaica. Now, when Hogarth was drawing his idea of uh, London terraced life in Gin Lane in 1751, he didn't actually add any botanical detail. If you look at the steps, they're remarkably clean. But I like to think that if you look behind the bad mother there, that wall she's leaning against, I imagine that behind that wall would look like this. The next phase of terraced housing was Victorian, where they had space in front, but not enough space to park a car. So there's enough for the, for the bins, but not much else. And in this damp, shady habitat, the most characteristic species is Pseudophomaria lutea. The big phase for terraced housing, though, was between the wars. This is um, Beacon Tree in Essex, which at the time it was built in the 1930s was the largest council estate in the world. Now, these did have bigger front gardens, and sadly, as you can see, almost all of them have been converted from gardens into car parks. But this has created a very distinctive habitat of brick paviors set in sand, which are dominated by this very charismatic plant, Nephalium luteoalbum, now Lefangium. It's extraordinary in its distribution within London. If you... Um, look at the map of the distribution in one kilometer squares, you'll see it's very common in the east end of the city of London, but also in the Essex part of London from Barking to Dagenham there and from Ilford up to Romford. It's everywhere, but it's much more common in Essex than anywhere else. You can see it there in St Albans and down to Red Hill, but it really does like Essex more than anywhere else. Another very distinctive botanical community is that which surrounds high rise flats in London. Most of them don't have gardens of their own and are maintained by the council, they're surrounded by an incredibly dull grassland that we in the trade call dog piss grassland. It's Lollium perenne and often very little else besides. But in the dank shade at the bottom of the flats, you'll see this plant, Pentaglottis sempervirens, one of the most pernicious invaders and destroyers of native biodiversity in the whole of London. Moving up in terms of expense, there are huge areas of South London dominated by between the wars, semi-detached housing like this. You can imagine this is where Tony Hancock lived in Cheam. So you'd be paying about 780,000 pounds for a semi in Cheam these days. But the garden would be splendid by its display of Eridrin Karvinskianus if it was at all typical. If you wanted a detached house in leafy suburbia that had its own drive and garage, you'd be paying nowadays about 2 million pounds for the privilege. <laughs> 
These gardens are often very species rich, but the thing that naturalizes most freely, in my experience, is this one, is Linaria purpurea. Very attractive, but almost completely naturalized now. Now, if you're a premiership footballer, you'd probably want to live in a house like this in gated suburbia, somewhere like St. George's Hill or Cobham or Virginia Water. Now you're paying perhaps 30 million pounds for the privilege. And the original house that was built on this grounds was probably much smaller. The garden was bigger and the house was smaller. What's happened over recent years is that the original 1930s houses have been demolished and these extraordinary, um, grotesque modern edifices have been built right up to the edges of the property on either side. These, these people are extremely wealthy in terms of cash, but not in terms of time or interest in gardening or botany. So these actually are amongst the dullest gardens in all of London, despite the fact that they're the most expensive. And the plant you're more likely to see than any other one is this the least interesting of all Britain's hedging plants. Clearly what these people most want to do is to disappear from view as quickly as possible. The complete opposite end of the spectrum are bungalows where the people who live there typically are retired and typically have lots of time, even if they don't have lots of money. And one of the things you notice about bungalow gardens is that they're reluctant to control their rampant attractive plants. So one of the things that will often dominate a bungalow garden is Muscaria meniacum. It sells seeds like bilio and forms completely exclusive monocultures. Now, some plants in London have done extremely well in recent years. This one, Poa infirma, is known from Poa annua by its absolutely tiny anthers. And it is under-recorded largely because it flowers before most botanists have come out of their winter hibernation. So it's in full flower in March. Very attractive increaser is this one, Senecio inequidens from South Africa, which um, grows on pavement cracks. And probably the biggest increaser is this grass, waterbent, Polypogon viridis, which is spreading now in Edinburgh as quickly as it did in London 20 or so years ago. I'll just finish by showing you one example of London's heat island and the absolutely bizarre effects of climate warming on the flora of London. Now, some of you may have this little thing as a house plant. This is China doll plant, Radomacara sinica. And someone who lived on Richmond Road in Hackney had one of these that got a bit big for the house. So they put it out with the bins in the front yard. And this is what happened. So this has survived multiple winters, probably 20 or so winters, and is now taller than the edge of the roof. Absolutely amazing plant of Radomacra sinica in Hackney. It's flowering and fruiting here last year, perfectly happily, quite extraordinary. And that draws attention to one of the great joys of urban botanizing. And that is that you really never know what you're going to come across next. So here, as I was walking back to the pub on North End Road, you'll know it, the Three Kings in W14, there's Bougainvillea growing up the front of a perfectly ordinary terrace. Amazing. So there you have it, the joys of urban botanizing.